everyone. My name is Leah Debon of Lean Frontiers, and I will be your host for today's webinar. We will not be fielding questions today since we have such a small time frame for the presentation. Um, but for now, I would like to introduce our facilitator for today, Harry Moser, um, and his, a little bit about him. After leading GF Agi Charmi for 25 years, Harry founded the Reshoring Initiative to bring 5 million manufacturing jobs back to the U.S. Largely due to the success of the Reshoring Initiative, Harry was inducted into the Industry Week Manufacturing Hall of Fame 2010, participated actively in President Obama's insourcing forum at the White House, and is on the Commerce Department Investment Ind Advisory Council. Harry is frequently quoted in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and Forbes, and seen on Fox Business, Market Watch, and other national TV and radio programs. He received engineering degrees at MIT and an MBA from the University of Chicago. And so now I will turn it over to Harry. Thank you very much. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate uh, everybody taking time out of being uh, sequestered at home to, to participate in the webinar. And I you know, re really do appreciate your time. Uh, I, um, I'm going to talk about you know, the, the COVID-19 and it's supply chain wake up call what we've learned from it what we have to what we should be doing as a result of it okay so so covid-19 you can see the the uh, the virus there and the the immediate one of the very immediate visible impacts has been on the supply chain we've all read about the the gowns the uh, masks of various kinds, or the the N95, other kinds of masks, uh, the the pharmaceuticals, the gloves, all these things that that the, that the medical first line people are screaming because they don't have enough of them, and 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 in many cases they're right, they don't have enough of them, but the problem is primarily that we don't produce enough of them, that we we don't do not have a a functional supply chain for these items, you know specifically. We're about 70 to 90 percent, 95 percent import dependent, and primarily on China, uh, specifically penicillin, antibiotics. We get like 90, 95 percent from there, and most of the ingredients that go into other pharmaceuticals come from China. And so, on the one hand, we're very dependent on offshore for these products, and on the other hand, 70 percent or 70 of the 195 countries in the world have restricted exports. So we don't make very many of them. And right now that everybody needs them, we can't get them very well from offshore. And the little bit that we do make, let's say we normally make 5% of normal needs here. And now the demand is 10 times as high as it used to be. So to meet the current demand, we would have to increase our production by 20 times, by 200 times, by huge numbers, which is not those of you in manufacturing know awfully hard to go up by a factor of 200 very quickly so the result has been that the u.s global supply chain for medical products has failed now in contrast to that short supply chains supply chains where components and ingredients come in from local sourcing ideally within the country but at least within the continent you can see here i've shown a little Canada and a little Mexico here. Those supply chains are stronger, more resilient. You can get the product faster. You don't have to wait for it. Uh, the, especially if you make it in your own country, there's no other country telling you you can't have them. And so as a result of all the, all the uh, visibility of this problem, uh, bills have been introduced in Washington by a whole list of senators and a, and a list of representatives <clears throat> to overcome that problem, to reduce our medical supply dependency. And you can see there's Republicans and there's Democrats. So it seems like one of those bipartisan things that, that everybody's gonna get on board and do. So, so I, I expect, I'm, I'm sure, there, there will be action to overcome this problem, to make the US much more domestically self-sufficient on medical products. And I, I believe, that that will bridge over to other products. Because here's a here's a partial list of other key dependencies. We, we've heard about rare earth minerals, which are key to 
making electronic components and, and aerospace uh, parts, and almost all comes out of China. All kinds of electronic components you, can, you essentially just about can't get here anymore. Most of the 5G equipment, 97% of apparel and footwear. You know, we, we don't make a lot anymore of machine tools or foundry equipment. We don't make a lot of aluminum, which has a lot of obviously critical needs. Electric motors, we get a lot of. Even, even the Defense Department says every year that the amount of material that they cannot source in the US and have to get elsewhere is going up, that we're getting less and less self-sufficient to maintain what it used to be called the arsenal of democracy. Here's another way of looking at that. This, this is International Trade Commission data, and uh, it's, a, it's a series of product categories. Like each of, each of these is a product category, and the red is the amount of imports, the green is the amount of exports. So you can say, first of all, there's a lot more red than there is green. So we, we import 800 billion, that's with a B, billion dollars a year more than we export, and that's about five million manufacturing jobs worth of, of imports, uh, excess. And when you look at the categories, uh, over here where we're very dependent on imports, you get some important things like motor cars, cell phones, computers, uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, motor vehicle parts, furniture, televisions, gas turbines, vaccines, very important, very important things, you know, for, for, especially for a high-tech industrial society. And over here where we're more, uh, where, where we do a better job at exporting and we export more than we import, we do well with aircraft. You know, Boeing has done a good job. Uh, but other than that, it's petroleum, petroleum gases, soybeans, corn, gold. So we sound, we sound more like a developing country, which is surviving based on exporting uh, minerals, than like the uh, leading world economy, which at one time was dominant or at least very strong in core industrial and consumer products. So what can we do about that? We say restore balance, you know, bring that that trade, that $800 billion per year trade deficit back towards balance, back towards where our exports equal our imports, where we're more self-sufficient in, in terms of things like the medical products, but also some of these other categories that I described. So, so we uh, help uh, reshoring, which is also called by some people backshoring or onshoring, or occasionally insourcing. But the whole idea is to bring back and, or once again manufacture products that will be sold or assembled here. So, so we, we don't. We're happy to have things made in China for Chinese, Germany for the Europeans. That's wonderful. But the things that are going to be sold, assembled, consumed here, more of it should be made here. A, a related concept is FDI, foreign direct investment, and so. GM does reshoring when it brings back the production of a, of a component or a vehicle. The Toyota does FDI, foreign direct investment, when it puts a factory here. Some people talk about localization, producing near the consumer. So we're all familiar with, we ought to get the lettuce and the cucumbers from a farm near us. That's, it's fresher, it helps the local farmer, et cetera, et cetera. The same is true for the, the industrial and, and hard goods that we, that we consume. Um, We'll often hear about nearshoring. So nearshoring for products that are going to be sold in the U.S. would be to shift production from, let's say, China or India, somewhere far away, to near, to a nearshore, such as Mexico or Canada. And my first choice is for product to come back to the U.S. since, since I'm a U.S. citizen. But there's some labor-intensive products that you just can't get back here, no matter how lean you are, no matter how much you automate, you just can't, cannot get the economics to work out in the U.S. And if they go to Mexico or made in Mexico and are shipped here, typically they'll have 40% U.S. content, whereas when they come out of China, they have 5% U.S. content. So I'm not here to advocate nearshoring, but to say that I'd much rather have 40% than 5%. Uh, all of this finally comes down to total cost, to, to the concept of looking at all the relevant costs, and I'll, I'll go into that. Some some encouraging data. This chart shows uh, unit labor costs expressed in dollars 
in a variety of countries. So here's the United States. This goes from 2000 to 2015, stayed about flat. We've had about 2% inflation, about 2% productivity increase. Unit labor cost stays about the same. Other countries vary around mainly with currency. Here's China. So China is up to about 500. So it's their unit labor cost, the, the cost in dollars of their labor per unit of output is about five times as high as it was 20 years ago. And that takes them from being just so cheap that, that, that almost any company would have to go there to no longer being so cheap. And now it makes sense to reevaluate and think if it makes sense to bring the work back. As a result of, of the several trends such as that, uh, reshoring and FDI together have done rather well. This is cumulative from 2010 up to about 2019. And you can see we've gone to, so now a total of 900,000 manufacturing jobs have been uh, announced uh, coming back. So qu qu quite a goodly number. And, and if you look at the annual rate, back in 2010, it was 6,000 per year manufacturing jobs. And by 2017, you can see the steepest slope was there. We actually had announcements of 180,000, so 30 times as high as it used to be. But e and even though it's done very well, so I'm very gratified because we founded the Reshoring Initiative in 2010, uh, it's not enough. You know, dis despite this wonderful uh, results, progress, the, the rate of imports has grown. So we need to reshore or FDI two or three times as much if we want to achieve some kind of balance between imports and exports and, and to achieve self-sufficiency and lack of dependency. If we want to achieve that within 10 or 20 years, we have to go two or three times as fast. So I'm here to tell you about this and hope some of you will find ways to achieve that in your companies. So the, 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 the problem, as I mentioned, is the lack of use of total cost. So about 60, that's 60% of manufacturers look only at the wage rate or maybe the purchase price. They talk about purchase price variance, the what I'm going to get it for versus what I had been paying here, or maybe landed costs, which might be duty and freight plus the X-Works price. <clears throat> and when they look at, at any of these measures, they're ignoring 15 to 25% of the total cost of offshore products. And, and I know you're not all in manufacturing, so it's very much the same concepts apply to um, back office processing, to, to call centers, to IT. You know, if you only look at the wage rate, it looks like you should send all, all of our jobs over there. But when you think about efficiency, when you think about being able to get together and work, uh, when you think about same time of day communication, there's a, a lot of advantage to doing things locally. So here's a, uh, a measure of that. So we, we provide, the Reshoring Initiative provides online at our website, the total cost of ownership estimator. And this is an example of someone who used that. And in this case, the, the Chinese X-Works price was 70, $70 per unit. The US was 100. And the, the procurement person, the buyer looks at that and says, wow, $30 difference, 30% difference. I'm going to buy 12,000 of those a year. The purchase price variance is $360,000. That's a third of my annual objective. I'm going to get my bonus. I might get promoted. Of course, we'll have the work done in, in China. And yet, when they looked at total cost of ownership, they saw that for China, it was 98 and the US was 108. So now there's only a 10% uh, uh, difference. And the uh, when you put in in the system a forecast of wage growth and currency change in the two countries, the, in a couple of years, the, the Chinese total cost was going to be higher. So hopefully that procurement person would say, wow, I don't think I should send the new product over there because I'm going to have to bring it back in a couple of years. And the work that's over there now, perhaps we should be looking at automation, at lean, at more training, and bring some of that work back because within a few years, strategically, that's the right thing to do. So uh, we've had hundreds of people use this system against all kinds of countries, most China. It turns out about 50% of the reshoring is from China. And when you take the data for price, 
Chinese price as a percentage of US price, you get the blue line. You can see it has a mode or peak down here around 72. But when you look at total cost, the peak is around 85. And if the product has a, a Trump 15% tariff on it, and I'm not here to advocate tariffs, I'm reporting data, but if it has a Trump 15% tariff, then the peak is around 98%. So as you go from a crude measure of just price up to total cost or total cost with the tariff, you can see how the curve shifts to the right. And the, and the goal line is getting above 100%, because when it's above 100%, then the US price or TCO is lower than the Chinese. So re-slicing that data here, here are those same three curves again. So you can see that of the hundreds of cases that were analyzed, it, when they looked just at price, only 8% of the work was in the US favor. That would make sense to come back. In, if they looked at total cost, 32% was in the US's favor. And if there happened to be a 15% tariff on it, then 46%. And I would say, if, if you could cut the manufacturing cost or the local price by 10% based on lean or automation or skilled workforce, that 46 would go up to more like 60%. So, so there's clear opportunities to apply your methodologies within your company or your community to bring more work back and to address those supply chain problems. So total cost, what is it? Well, there, it's got, in our version, it has about 29 costs. Some of those are what I call hard or firm, or like hard meaning like you can count it, you can feel the coin, you know, it's real, definitely real. Like duty, fees and insurance, freight, carrying cost of inventory, travel, inventory handling, you know, as opposed to just in time from a local supplier. And then there's risks, emergency air freight, the innovate, impact on innovation when engineering and manufacturing are 5,000 miles apart and, and separated by language and, and time zone, culture, uh, quality differentials, uh, intellectual property risk, opportunity costs. What, what's, the, what's the risk of stocking out when you have three month replenishment as opposed to two week local replenishment? The benefit of a made in USA uh, labeling, increasingly consumers, especially in today's crisis, are opting for made in USA. And various groups uh, have studied those hidden costs. And the hidden cost is the difference between the X-Works price and the total cost. It's these other 28 factors that are in here. And th their conclusions range everywhere from you know, 15 to 25 or 30%. So, so somewhere in that 20, 25% is probably a pretty fair number. Uh, Professor John Gray, I know well at Ohio State, he took four companies uh, Midwestern companies that had reshored a great variety of products and said, why did you, why did you offshore? And they said, because the, the labor was lower, the X-Works price was going to be lower. Okay. Then he said, why did you reshore? Because after a couple of years, we realized how many costs and risks and problems we had not quantified when we offshored. And we concluded it made sense to bring the work back here. And you might say, is this important? I'd say very much so, because companies source, companies, I'll say including retailers, source more imports than they produce or source in the US. And how do I get to that? The, uh, the goods imported, goods meaning things, products, uh, the, the price or the value of those imports is about 2.4 trillion with a T. And if you adjust that to US price levels that are about 30% higher on average, you get about 3.1 trillion. And US production of manufactured goods, about 2.4 trillion. You divide the, uh, the imports by the total consumption, which is the uh, production plus the imports, you get about 56%. So an awful lot of the decisions by retailers, by manufacturers is is buying the buying of imports and therefore if they decided in any significant percentage to shift to buying or producing domestically a huge impact on on the economy so 
Uh, going back a little bit historically, we all know Deming and his fourth key principle for management from out of the crisis, end the practice of awarding business on the basis of price tag, instead minimize total cost. Now, absolutely crystal clear. And if you look at his principles, many of them are applied by companies, and but this one is typically not applied. So a great opportunity for you to make a difference at your company or the companies with which you consult. John Shook at the Lean Enterprise Institute uh, talks about the same thing, that, that uh, companies need to look at the total costs and the problems that, assume, that arise if you don't do that, that the cost is huge. And my neighbor up in Maine, this is James Womack, many of you know, uh, about, about a half a mile away from me in Maine. He's here on, on my deck, see the picture. And he says, do the math. Think about all those other costs, calculate the true costs, and uh, if you do that, you'll you'll likely to bring the work so some, not all, but some of the work back to the country. Thank you, Jim. So uh, my, my contribution, I'm, I'm not a lean expert. My little contribution to this is the concept of walking the whole gemba. And and here's my theory: uh, is that most U.S. companies, you know, say, say General Motors, you know. They, their lean experts focus on lean in their domestic operations. And they may have an offshore supplier who has a lean expert focusing on lean in that offshore factory. But I'm quite sure that the lean expert in the offshore factory supplier is not analyzing whether it really makes sense for GM to source from his factory because he wants GM to source from his factories. They, they look only at internal issues. And the GM people here in the US look at internal issues here. And by, by accepting that the imports are a given and not using total cost, the lean practitioners as a whole are ignoring most of the Gamba, because most of the Gamba is the sort of the interaction between the two and the wisdom of continuing to have those long supply chains. So, so we believe that if, if you don't think about how much uh, cheaper U.S. production would be if done in the best lean way and make, making some of that uh, uh, reshoring possible, they are ignoring the whole gamble. So that's my little contribution to this uh, uh, art or science. Uh, Toyota production system lists seven uh, wastes and the slide shows in the right-hand column that for each waste how offshoring makes that waste worse or bigger so it's it's to me it's quite clear that that uh, offshoring you know producing things at a great distance and shipping them somewhere is is not consistent with uh, toyota production system with lean with uh, value generation so the uh, another way of looking at that most of us believe that our our task is to bring value to the customer if we do that we'll we and our organizations will succeed. And we, we say that you have to measure accurately if you want to eliminate waste to reveal opportunities and that the customers, the people you're bringing value to, they put value on quality, on delivery, on made in USA because it helps employ their, their neighbors, on sustainability in the environment and on, and on price. But they don't per se put value on made in China or India. And, and a product spending weeks in a container. It's not like wine that has to age. <coughs> Excuse me, if anything, products are better if they don't get so old. So, so we, we accept that there's, uh, we, why should we accept complexity? Why should we accept uncertainty and waste? And so the challenge is to use total cost to see for which prod products the values delivered such as sustainability, made in the U.S., quality, et cetera, are, are, are of a magnitude sufficient to overcome the inevitably higher domestic FOB price. So as an example of this, my, my favorite example, a company called Mori, M-O-R-E-Y Corp. They're a, an EMS company. They, they populate circuit boards and make, make uh, assemblies, including those circuit boards. And they're in Woodridge, Illinois. And uh, I, I had gotten to know them, and, and the, the VP sales called me four or five years ago, and he said, Harry, we're about to lose our best U.S. customer, a Chinese 
the competitor has offered them a lower price, what can I do? And I said, well, let's do the TCO calculation. And Tony and I did the TCO calculation and he took it in to his customer and showed the customer that even though Tony's price was higher, the total cost from the customer's perspective was lower. And Tony credits that with saving a 60, that's six zero million dollar order. Now I should have been smart enough to ask for a commission, but I was delighted to have kept those jobs in the US and helped Tony. And we can do the same for you. So uh, you're always faced with uh, justifying lean. You know, how, how can we justify uh, doing these lean efforts to make things better at the company? And, 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 and we say that by, by understanding the advantage of producing near the consumer and understanding the small total cost gap instead of looking at the large price gap that the benefit of what Womack calls lean shoring uh, should become clear and should make sense to bring some production back where your lean contribution can make an important uh, add to bring that work back. So uh, we believe that U.S. companies can justify investment like capital equipment, automation, industry 4.0, process improvement like lean, training, and, and that we can be profitable and competitive and not have to sacrifice quality, delivery, time to market, or employees. Notice that we can, we can benefit our stakeholders, our community, our employees, our customers, the environment, and, and not hurt profitability. So we have a program to help all of you do this. First, we have the TCO Estimator, which is free online. So all of you have to have to do is go there to the website, uh, sign up, sign in, use it. There's examples, there's instructions. You know, it, sh it should be pretty clear. You're welcome to call me, email me if you want help. We would be delighted to have you use it. Love to hear about your results. Uh, in addition, we have a, another program we call the Import Substitution Program, and where the TCO Estimator is, is a tool for purchasing and it's a tool for selling, the import substitution program tells you to whom to sell. So we can provide data on the importers of the products you produce or could produce domestically, the things where your factory, your equipment is highly competitive. So we we go back and forth with you until we've defined that those product categories well, and then we send you a list of what companies are importing those, what their address is, what they're, exactly what they're bringing in, how many tons per year, some idea of the dollars they're paying for them, who the offshore supplier is, and we train your team to sell using total cost. Right now, your salesmen go into those companies and say, do you need any more widgets next year? And the, and the customer says, well, no, nah, we're okay, I'll call you if anything goes wrong. And instead, your salesman can come in and say, I know you're bringing in 50 tons per year of widgets. We have this new machine that's the best in the world, the most competitive, the most accurate for making widgets. We've calculated the uh, manufacturing cost here and labor is only 10% of the total. So your ex the price you're paying offshore can't be much more than 10% less than what we're gonna charge. And we've calculated the hidden costs, you know, that, those extra things, and they amount to about 20%. So we're pretty sure that if you bring your work back to us, that you're gonna save five or 10% and you're doing something for your country and your community, et cetera. So let's, let's get together and work this out to our mutual benefit. Uh, we also have a, uh, two reshoring awards. One I've got a slide for is the metalworking reshoring award we put on with these other groups. And it's about metal forming, casting, machining, additive, that whole thing. Um, it'll be awarded at IMTS, the 130,000 uh, person uh, trade show, which is taking place at McCormick Place in September. So if any of you have reshored something metallic, you can uh, apply for that. You've got another month and a half about to do so. And then in addition, we work with uh, an organization called Seams on the Sewn Products Reshoring Award. And you can find that on our website. So my objective for you, my objective for lean practitioners is to appreciate the lean impact of using total cost. Now, Deming talked about it, Womack, Shook, all these great 
leaders have, have described the importance of it. You know, I, I, I hope you'll appreciate it. You'll embrace it. You'll make it part of your toolkit, part of your, your portfolio. You'll apply it to both sourcing and siting. You know, it's where we buy things, where we put our factories in, in your factory. That you'll, For your company, you'll help others to do that. You'll help procurement and sales implement it, like I did with Moricorp. You can use our free TCO estimate. I, I hope you'll tell us of your successes because the only way we keep track of the number of jobs is to know who has succeeded. So we're a, a, a nonprofit. We have 23 sponsors. You can see them here. The AMT is the one that puts on IMTS. DGS is our, our marketing agency. Gardner puts out a whole series of excellent uh, uh, magazines like, like Modern Machine Shop. Uh, GF is the company I used to run, and and more down here. Wonderful companies and trade organizations which have helped us uh, over the years, so that we could bring this message and these tools to you. And again, uh, I'm here. I am available uh, to help you uh, to simplify your lean journey because it's the the journey simpler when it's short. When your if your supply chain is short, so we think of ourselves as the little Dutch boy holding back the the flood of, of imports, and we need your help to rebuild that dike and, and uh, make the US more uh, resilient. So you've got my name, phone number, email address, the website, you've got links to most of these things I've talked about. I'm, we're, we're here, these other, these sponsors make it possible for us to be here to help you. So I look forward to your calls, your emails, your successes. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Harry. And just a reminder to everyone that today's session was recorded. So you will receive an email shortly with a link to view that recording. And we do encourage you to share this recording throughout your organization to those um, who you think might find it helpful. Um, so thank you again and uh, to Harry and to everybody who participated in today's session and have a great day.